good to see everyone this evening, especially uh, welcome to those who are visiting. encourage you to come back and visit with us at every opportunity that you might have. You know, job hunting can be a real challenge. Not only for the one looking for a job, but it is also quite a challenge for the one doing the hiring. And, and certainly those who are looking for a job, there are a lot of things that they have to factor in to consider. For example, salary, benefits, what kind of retirement do they offer? And, and for most, there's the question, can I support a family on what this job pays. Now, and of course, on the other hand, the one doing the hiring, and I know some of you have businesses and, and you understand what I'm talking about, but, but you also have to think about the salary that you pay and the benefits and what it costs you to hire that person. And the bottom line for the employer is, can I make a profit based upon what I'm going to pay this individual? Or to put it rather bluntly, is he worth it? Is he worth what it's going to cost to hire him? And you know, we all know, I'm sure at least if you're of working age, you know the challenge it can be to find a job or at least to find the, uh, the right job. And, and, and I've heard employers talk about how difficult it is to get good workers, you know. They said, oh, we can hire people, but nobody wants to work. And so it's a problem on both sides of the aisle trying to, uh, to find jobs or to find workers there. Now, you say, well, where are you going with this? What's the point? The Lord, during his earthly ministry was looking, if you'll allow me to use the term the Marines used a few years ago, the Lord was looking for a few good men. He had many disciples, many who followed him, but he was looking for twelve apostles who would carry on his work once he ascended back into heaven. Once he left them there, they would do the actual establishing of the church, preaching the gospel there in Acts chapter 2, and, and ultimately they would help to carry the gospel throughout the world. And so... During the early days of his ministry, there were many who followed him, and there were many who, as I say, are called disciples. And, and ultimately, it came down to Jesus, and after he prayed all night to the Father, Jim talked about praying all night this morning, Jesus prayed all night before choosing the twelve. And you know, as you look at the various men that he chose, think about uh, their qualifications. Were they educated? Were they scholars? Were these money men, did they have good jobs? Could they support themselves financially as they did the work of the Lord? And, and just what about their personalities, you know? Because this, this was a very responsible position they were going to be filling. They were going to have the greatest job to carry out the gospel. And of course, as we look at you know, the, the different ones there, one stands out. Usually when you mention the twelve, one of the first names that comes to mind, and I'm not going to do it, but if I ask you to write down who you think of when I mention the apostles, I dare say that over 50% would say Simon Peter or Peter. That's the name that we associate with the apostles. And in fact, if you ask people name the apostles, usually he's the first name. And maybe that's because the little VBS song we sing, uh, Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. But Peter is well known. But if you'd been with the Lord when he's choosing the twelve on that occasion, Mark, it's hot up here. If you'd been with the Lord on that day when he was choosing the apostles, and he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, and we don't have the text, so I'm just kind of making the narrative here, but, but in essence he says to Peter, I, I want you to be one of my apostles. You would have probably leaned over and said, uh -uh, Lord, are you sure about this? Lord, you, you, you really might want to reconsider this guy. I, I don't think he's what you... You know, if you were the human resources person or the interviewer, and you're sitting there with your boss interviewing for these apostleship positions, you would have probably under your breath said, uh -huh, uh -huh, he's not the one. You say, well, why? Because as we look at Peter, Peter had flaws galore. Not to sound judgmental, not to be ugly, not to be, and Peter was a great man, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, Peter had some real issues. And so I ask you this evening, was Peter really a good choice to be an apostle? Or did the Lord you know, need you know, a black sheep of the family, so to speak? Did he need one like Peter to, to even things out? And for that matter, why did the Lord choose Peter? Based upon the fact that, and I don't want to jump ahead of myself, that later Peter is going to deny the Lord. If you knew somebody was going to cut your throat steal your money at a business or, or, or sell out your, your secrets to a competitor, business competitor, would you hire that person? 
Probably not. You'd say, well, uh, you're overqualified for this job. Uh, you're not exactly what we're looking for. And you'd have kept looking. And so as we look at Peter and we look at the things that transpired during his apostleship, you've got to wonder, did the Lord make a mistake? Did he know what he was doing? Consider with me some of the, the attributes of Peter that, that make him at least questionable. And don't get me wrong, because in the end, I think you'll understand where I'm going with this. But you know, first of all, Peter was a sinner. Now just a few moments ago, we had a reading from Luke chapter 5. The Lord asked Peter, he said, and, and the others were there as well, but he says, take the boat, go out a little ways from shore, and put out your nets. In other words, do some fishing. Not an unusual command, right? Except they've been fishing all night with no luck. I know some of us have been there and done that. Fished all night and caught nothing. And so they're, they're, they're tired. They're probably sleepy. They're, they're probably hungry. And here's the Lord saying, put out your net. Oh, we fished all night, Lord. Why? <laughs> they're just not, oh, I shouldn't say they're not biting because they weren't biting and this is catching the way we would today. They were using net. But, but they're just not out there, Lord. It's just a waste of time. We're tired. They'd had a disappointing night. And if you'll notice what he said there in verse uh, 8 there, when Simon Peter saw this draft of fishes, in fact, both boats almost sunk because of the number of fish that were caught. What does Peter do? He falls down at the feet of Jesus. And notice what he says. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, to his credit, Peter acknowledged the fact that he was a sinful man. But you see, he doubted the Lord. He doubted when the Lord gave him a command to go and to do something there. Now, that attitude of, I'm a sinful man, that wouldn't look good on a resume. I mean, take my word for it. If you're looking for a job and you're filling out a resume or a job application and they ask about your job qualifications, what qualifies you for this job, don't put, I'm a sinner. It really wouldn't stand you in good. But yet, right off the bat, as we look at this man, Peter, he, he was a sinner. But not only that, as we look at the life of Peter, here was a man who was fickle. Now, if you don't know what the word fickle means, do what I did. Get online, go to Webster's.com, and look it up. The word fickle, and I see some of you grabbing your phones right now. But the word fickle, if, if you look it up, is, quote, marked by lack of steadfastness, constancy, or stability, given to erratic changeableness. Now, you remember in Matthew 26, 35, Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me, Peter. And I would love to have seen Peter's face based upon what he said. Me? No way, Lord. I, I never... Now, these other guys may deny you, but I would never deny... I will die for you, Lord. There is no way I could ever deny you. And yet, we know from Scripture, if you just keep reading that same chapter... A few verses later, Peter indeed denies the Lord, just as the Lord had said. In spite of his emphatic proclamations, not me, it'll never happen. Oh, these other guys may, Lord, but you can count on me. I'm dependable. When the going got tough, when he was in a situation where it would appear he feared, perhaps for his life, he denied the Lord. Not once, not twice, but three times, even denying the Lord with an oath, and the third time using profanity there. His resolve left him. Now, you would assume that choosing someone for such an important position as being an apostle, one who just some three years later is going to preach the first gospel sermon there in Jerusalem and, and bring the church into existence, you would think in choosing someone for that important decision, job, the Lord would have wanted someone who was reliable, someone who was steadfast, someone who was brave in the face of danger. In fact, I would have wanted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now you talk about some guys who were strong. You remember them from the book of Daniel? The king of Babylon called them in and said, look, you bow down and worship my golden altar, you're fine. But if you don't, you're going to pay. And he specified what that punishment was. You're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. They didn't quake. They weren't afraid, at least not from what they said. Remember Daniel 3, 17 and 18? 
They spoke to the king and they said, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Notice verse 18. But if not be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You talk about courage. You talk about resolve. They were not going to... Look, God's able to save us. Now, whether he does it or not, we don't know. But in either case, we're not going to bow to your old idol. And the king was furious. He had the furnace heated up seven times hotter than usual. In fact, the text says that the fire was so hot, the soldiers that threw them in died from the heat. And again, this is one of those stories in the Bible that would have been great to have just been a fly on the wall and to have seen what happened. And we don't have the details, but they're thrown in the furnace and the king goes over and he's looking through the door and he sees four people in there instead of three. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown in. He looks in, there's a fourth one. And of course he calls them out and their hair's not singed, their clothes don't even smell smoky. And, and he acknowledges, you know, the God you serve, he is God. That's the kind of men that I would have wanted to choose for apostles because, because think of the persecution they're going to face. And sadly, Peter didn't have this quality, if you will. Instead of being dependable, he, he was fickle, undependable. He wasn't a man who could be trusted in times of crisis and he was subject to weakness. And again, not exactly a sterling comment to put on a resume, is it? Well, I'm fickle. You can count on me some of the time, probably, well, maybe. But that was Peter. But look at something else about Peter. Not only was he fickle, he was impulsive, he was rash, even impetuous. Again, if you look up that word impulsive, it's, it's by Webster's defined, quote, a sudden spontaneous inclination or incitement to some unusual, unpremeditated action. You know, the best way to describe Peter, and I've heard numerous people in Bible classes and in sermons say, you know, Peter was outspoken. Peter was the guy, the first one to jump in to speak up when a question was asked or sometimes even when it wasn't asked. And oftentimes, Peter spoke without thinking. I had a fifth grade teacher, and I don't remember much else she taught me, but I do remember her saying this many, many times. She said, don't put your mouth in motion until your mind is in gear. And sometimes Peter put his mouth in motion when his brain wasn't in gear. Allow me to give you some examples. Luke chapter 8 and verse 54. Jesus traveling along, the apostles are there, and there's a crowd of people thronging about him, and there was a woman that had an issue of blood. And this woman obviously had heard something about Jesus because she was confident. She had faith that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. And so she gets up, and this is much more of a challenge than it would be today because women just didn't approach a man, not in public. And certainly you wouldn't reach out and touch their clothes. But this woman touches the hem of Jesus' garment, and he stops. And you remember what he says, don't you? Who touched me? And it's kind of interesting, he's being thronged by people, but notice it's Peter that speaks up. Now the others, it would seem from the text, are maybe nodding, yeah, that's right, yeah, uh-huh, Peter's right. Listen to what's said in verse 45, Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter, and they that were with him said, Master, the multitudes throng thee, and press thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? In other words, Lord, people are all around you, people are pressing in. What do you mean, who touched you? And I can visualize the others going, yeah, that's right, Lord, what do you mean? Why would you ask who touched you? But Peter's name is specifically mentioned here, speaking up. The fact the Lord said who touched me was a pretty good indication that somebody had touched him in a very unique, a very special way. And Jesus was not asking the question for information. He knew who had touched him. He knew why she had touched him. But you see, he's wanting to bring to light what has happened and the healing of this woman that took place. On another occasion... The Lord took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain of transfiguration. And I know you remember this story. It's very familiar. Again, it's Peter who speaks up. And he's speaking. Maybe he says this. I don't know. So this is just speculation. Maybe he asked this question or, or makes this statement because he didn't know what else to say. They're frightened. They really don't understand what's going on. But read with me Matthew 17, 3 and 4. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. 
Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. Now, a tabernacle was a tent. It could be a place of worship. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And, of course, you remember the voice spoke from heaven and basically refuted what Peter had just said. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. In other words, listen to him. In Matthew 16, on another occasion, Jesus asked, Who do men say that I am? What's the public opinion? What are people saying about me? And, and they begin to tell him, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some say oh, one of the prophets. And then the Lord brings it down very personal, and he says, But whom say ye that I am? And once again, it's Peter that jumps in and speaks up and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We see the impetuous. Now, he was right, but he was impetuous here to jump in and to speak before anyone else did. And, of course, the Lord commended him. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And if you read down just a few more verses here, we see once again that impetuous nature, that rashness uh, that was so characteristic of Peter. Notice verse 21. <clears throat> From that time Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Notice the Lord's response to Peter. He didn't say, thank you, Peter, I appreciate that. No, he says, get thee behind me, Satan. For thou art an offense unto me, and thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Again, we see the rashness of Peter in John 18 when he's in the garden. The multitude that come out to arrest Jesus. Judas has just betrayed him. You know, that's the man. And as they're taking him, what does Peter do? He pulls out a sword and he starts swinging and he takes the ear off Malchus, the servant of the high priest. And Jesus again rebuked him for that rashness and says, put it up, Peter. Put your sword up. It was not the time for a physical battle here. After the Lord's resurrection in John 21... When Peter and the others were out fishing, they thought Jesus was dead, and suddenly they're not convinced that he's been resurrected, at least at this point, I think. But they see him standing on the shore. And somebody says, look, it's the Lord. What does Peter do? He grabs his coat and he jumps in, starts swimming for shore, and the others come in the boat. Now some would say, well, that's commendably. We want to be the Lord, but just illustrating again this rashness or impetuous behavior that Peter had. So again, we could add that to Peter's resume, that he tended to act rashly sometimes and... He's not looking very promising, is he, as a candidate? You know, if you're wanting to hire someone for a responsible job, you don't want someone who's rash, someone who acts that. But that's not all. Again, looking at Peter, we see that he was a man with a weakness. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul reveals this situation that took place. Peter is there with the Gentiles and he's visiting with them, he's talking with them, he's eating with them, he's in full fellowship with the Gentiles. And just as a sidebar here, you can imagine how the Gentiles felt. Wow, this is the great apostle Peter and he's sitting here eating with us and talking to us. Everything was just fine. Wow, we're brethren, you know. No more Jew and Gentile stuff. We're Christians. But then some Jews come in. And it stood of Peter saying, Hey, brothers, come on in. I want to introduce you to my friends here. I want you to meet your brothers here, your sisters. What does Peter do? He begins to back away. You can imagine he's looking around like, I don't know who these people are. I'm not with them. They're not with me. In fact, Paul rebuked him. Notice here what happens. Verse 13. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now that word dissimulation means hypocrisy. Peter's actions caused Barnabas and others to act hypocritically just as he was acting. And somebody says, well, Peter was acting as a racist. No, he was. It had nothing to do with racism. He was a hypocrite because he didn't want to be seen with these people. 
Because you see, at this point, there was still a lot of prejudice there between Jews and Gentiles that has not completely gone away. Now, obviously, with the passing of time, that barrier disappeared. But at this point in church history, there's still some prejudice. As we see in Acts chapter 15, they were trying to bind circumcision and other things on Gentile converts. And the apostles sent a letter and said, uh-uh, no. We're not going to put a yoke on the Gentiles that our own fathers couldn't even bear. But you see, Peter acted rationally. And Paul says what? I condemned him to the face. The King James says, I withstood him to the face. So not only do we have Peter being rebuked by Paul, but it was a public rebuke. Of course, we have no record of Peter ever doing this again. Notice verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not, this is Paul writing, I saw they walked not according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? In other words, why do you want them to be Jews? Why are you trying to get them to be Jews? Gentiles. You're being hypocritical. Again, not a good quality there. We mentioned the denial of Christ by Jesus, or excuse me, the denial of Jesus by Peter a few minutes ago. And as I say, the first maid comes up and says, Hey, you're, you're with Jesus, aren't you? Oh, no, not me. A few minutes later, a second maid came up and said, Yeah, you're one of them. And no, and he basically made an oath, you know, I swear, was what we, some would say today. No, I, I don't know him. And the third one came up, and this time he used profanity. He cursed and said, I know not the man. And this is exactly what Jesus had said would happen in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 26. And yet in spite of all of this, the Lord chose him to be an apostle. But one other thought. Peter was childish. You know... I don't know any other way to put it. There were times that Peter came across as being very childish in his actions here and, and sometimes knows that, you know, little children will come up and say, what you doing? You're writing a letter. What you writing? What's that? You expect it out of children, but not out of grown-ups. John chapter 21 and verse 18 is the passage I'm thinking about here. When Jesus was crucified and resurrected, you remember when he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, well, of course I love you, Lord. And I'm paraphrasing. And he says, go feed my sheep. And then he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, well, yes, I love you. And by the way, the word Jesus uses for love is not the same word that Peter says. So he's asking, do you love me this way? And Peter says, I love you this way. But this went on three times, and Peter's getting kind of frustrated, you know. Each time, Jesus would say, go feed my sheep. But then notice verse 18 of John 21. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest, we would say clothed or dressed thyself, and walked whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee or dress thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Now, after Jesus had spoken these words to Peter, what does he say? He looks back because John is following Peter and Jesus, and notice what he says there. And what shall this man do, Lord? That wasn't Peter's job to question, was it? You know, as, as my mama would have said, that's none of your business. But he says, Lord, what shall this man do? And what the Lord had in mind for John had nothing to do with Peter. They had different works, unique works. And of course, I don't mean to imply that Peter was the only one. Remember in Matthew 18, some of the disciples, some of the apostles came to Jesus about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. But I find it interesting. Well, let me just read there, beginning in verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto thee, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's not specifically stated, but is there any reason not to believe that Peter was not with the others here in raising this question? You know, they'd been arguing, discussing, whatever you want to call it among themselves. Who's going to be the greatest? And we know that James and John had their mother go to Jesus and say, I want you to do something for me. When you have your kingdom, I want one of my sons on your left hand and one on the right. And so they were already vying for positions of authority. 
you know, who's going to be the top dog in the kingdom? And, of course, Jesus illustrated to them that greatness came through servitude. So with these things being said, look, look for just a moment. Consider Peter's resume. He was a sinner. He was fickle at times. He was unreliable. He was undependable. He was untrustworthy. He was unfaithful. He was impulsive. He was rash. He sometimes spoke when he should have been listening. He was weak. He was easily intimidated, nosy, and somewhat jealous of power. Now, based on these things, again, I ask you, would you have chosen Peter to be an apostle? Would you have chosen Peter to be the one to preach the inaugural, if you will, sermon that opened the doors of the kingdom? Probably not. But aren't you glad that we weren't the ones making that choice? Aren't you glad that it wasn't our position to say, uh-uh, Peter, you, you just... You're not what we're looking for. You need to go back to fishing. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe somebody else can use you, but we, we don't need you. But the Lord called him because the Lord saw, he knew Peter's heart. He saw the potential. And again, even though Peter stumbled big time there in Galatians with his hypocrisy, following Pentecost, we see a man who grew tremendously spiritually. And you see the problem, I said a moment ago, we would have probably said, no, Peter, we can't use you because we are like Samuel in the Old Testament. God had sent Samuel to the house of Jesse. Jesse was David's father, you recall. He sent Samuel to the house of Jesse to find a successor for King Saul. And so he says, bring him in. So they bring in the oldest son, and he's a big, tall, handsome, strapping fellow, you know. And Samuel, well, let's just read it here. Verse 7 of 1 Samuel 16. And this is after Samuel looks at him and says, Oh, this has got to be the Lord's anointing. Just look at this dude. Tall, handsome, strong. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. Why, Lord? He, he, he's kingly looking. He's got to be the one. But notice the Lord's answer that because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So again, Peter had flaws. A lot of them. But now let's be honest, people. We have flaws too, don't we? If I went down that list of things there, you know, childish, impetuous, uh, all the things we listed on the resume for Peter... If I asked for a show of hands, and if we were honest, we'd have hands doing this, wouldn't we? I'm not saying that we're all guilty of all of them, but, but every one of us would have to say, well, yeah, sometimes I speak out of school. Sometimes I don't do what I say I will do. I don't live up to my promises of, of faithfulness. And on and on, we, we all have many of the same flaws that Peter had. In fact, we probably have some flaws that, that he didn't have. And later in the book of Acts chapter 4, we find Peter showing the courage. We see the change in this man. He's standing before the Sanhedrin, and he faces them very boldly, and he even tells them to their face. Now remember, this is the Jewish high court who's just crucified not too long before the Son of God. And certainly they had the power to crucify Peter or do whatever they wanted. And yet he boldly tells them what? You crucified the Messiah. You killed the Son of God. I mean, he didn't make any bones about it. He, well, you know, you might ought to consider you possibly could have killed the wrong guy. You know, you might have killed him. No, he was bold about it. You crucified the promised one. And he went on to tell them in verse 12, there is neither is there salvation any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And even in the face of threats, you know, more than one occasion, they, they threatened, do not preach in the name of Jesus again. And they were beaten on occasion, he and the other apostles. And his words of Acts 5 and 29 are among the most quoted of his words probably. We ought to obey God rather than men. So what's the lesson for us? We need to have the patience the Lord had in choosing, making choices. Because none of us are perfect. Peter wasn't perfect. None of the apostles were perfect. But you see, the Lord worked with them. 
He helped them to grow. He helped them to develop. And the Lord knew that Peter would eventually accomplish great things in the kingdom. And today, you know, you mention the name Peter, we think, wow, the great apostle Peter. You know, inspired writer, first gospel sermon, performed miracles, worked with the Lord, sat at the feet of the Lord during his earthly ministry, and oh man, he, he, yeah. But we forget about the flaws, don't we? We forget that Peter was just like we are. But just as Peter grew and became stronger, so we can become stronger. The Lord can use us just as he used Peter. And when we see a brother and sister in Christ, and we see those flaws, whatever they may be, let's not be quick to write them off and say, well, look at him, I can't believe he's doing that. Or I can't believe she said that. When maybe we're guilty of something just as bad, maybe, maybe even worse. We need to develop that patience that our Lord had. You know, as a further reflection, we mentioned Peter's resume and all those bad things on it. What if you had to fill out a resume for the Lord? What, what would you put on it? I mean, what would you honestly say about yourself? if you were filling out a resume as a servant of Christ or a child of God? Would the Lord look at it and toss it in the round file? Or would he look at us and say as he did to Peter, I will make you fishers of men? Yes, Peter had weaknesses, but we all do. We're not Christians because we are perfect. We are not Christians because we are sinless. We are Christians because we are trying to live the best life that we can live. I've had people say, and I'm sure you have to, oh, you, you members of the church, or, or you Christians, you think you're perfect. And I say, no, we're not perfect. We stumble and make mistakes, but we try to live the way that God would have us to live. And so Peter, Peter is a source of encouragement to me because I look at Peter and I say, hey, you know, Peter had some of the same problems that I've got. And he overcame them. Peter has some of the same issues that I face and the Lord still used him. And he can and will use us today. You may not have a perfect resume, but Jesus loves you and he will accept you on his terms of pardon. And he will mold you and make you into the person that you can be, that he wants you to be. And he will use you in whatever way. And, and I don't know what it is because we all have talents and abilities and, and there are different things that we can do. And, and God's going to use us in whatever way that he sees fit if we will let him. The question is, are you going to let him mold you? And the first step in that is to become a Christian, to obey the gospel. Coming in faith, repenting and turning from your sins, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins that you might be added to his body, the church. And as a child of God, to go forth, flaws and all, determined to work on them. And with God's help, to be all that you can be. Perhaps you've not been living the Christian life, perhaps you've continued with those flaws and not really tried to deal with them, well, let me encourage you to change that. Ask for the prayers of the church. Ask God's forgiveness and make up your mind that, that you're going to be what you should be. You're going to serve Him to the best of your ability. Tonight, if you need to respond to this invitation of Christ, we're going to sing the song that's been announced and you have the opportunity to come while we stand and while we sing.